listening to Worth Electronics What's Up Radio Podcast, where each week we are seeing what's up in the world of electronics and PCB design. We're checking in with leading industry experts and our very own Worth Electronic technical specialists. We'll shine a light on our topics, such as energy harvesting, wireless power transfer, EMI issues, and so much more. Tune in to get technical design tips and applications during your commute, at your desk, or wherever you might be with Worth Electronics What's Up Podcast. As an increasing number of electrically powered devices are integrated into today's electrical grid, we are seeing a greater distortion to this grid, and it creates issues within the electrical distribution network. So to address these problems, power supply designs now require more advanced power factor correction or PFC circuitry to adhere to rigorous power factor standards. In today's podcast, we'll discuss microchip megatrends, digital signal controller in electric vehicles, along with EV charging and their effects on the electrical grid. We'll also show a totem pole PFC demonstration and block diagram and finish off with key components of the demo board. Hello, I'm Vijay Bapu. I'm product marketing manager at Microchip Technologies. And I work on power applications and DSP33 microcontroller. I am based in Chandler in Arizona in the US. In this presentation, I will talk about Microchip's totem pole demonstration application and some of the applications related to those. So in this presentation, I will go through the following topics. At a high level, I'll talk about what really power factor is and why power factor correction is needed. I'll touch upon a power factor correction topology and then uh, the meat of this presentation is really the totem pole demonstration application platform that has been recently been made available jointly by Microchip and Worth. I'll talk a little bit about what are the target market target markets for it, uh, what the design philosophy is, and what tool chain is available uh, for, for the application. So first, I'll give you a little bit of brief introduction to power factor and power factor correction. So what really is power factor? There's an interesting image here on the left, but I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. So really, to understand the term power factor, you need to understand the AC power has two components. The first is real power and the second is reactive power. Real power is used to do useful work such as creating heat, creating light or generating motion. And typically it is expressed in watts. This is what we typically all know about power. And reactive power on the other hand does no useful work really. Uh, And it is required to maintain electric or magnetic fields associated with reactive loads. Uh, like uh, induction motors and things like that. So reactive power is measured in volt amperes, usually denoted as VA, followed by a small R here to indicate that the power is reactive. So the total power demand from a load, including both the real power and the reactive power, is known as apparent power. So you you can see on the right, you can see the vector sum of uh, real power and reactive power equivalent to the apparent power. And this is also expressed, this is expressed in in volt amperes. So power factor is the ratio of real power to apparent power. And it is a unitless uh, uh, quantity and the range is in the range of uh, zero to one. And obviously, the higher, higher, the better. And in the glass of beer analogy, you can look. When you order a glass of beer, you want the beer to occupy the full glass. But when you order beer, typically you get a little bit of foam here. In this case, the foam is the reactive power, and the actual beer is the active power. So what you want to do is you want to maximize the power factor. In this case, you want to have the full glass of Uh, containing beer. So that's what really you want to do. So that's really the analogy and hope that was uh, was useful. So this is a typical powertrain for say a household appliance. There is an AC here at the left and is driving an AC to DC stage. The simplest stage would be a bridge rectifier 
followed by a smoothing capacitor. This then drives a DC to DC stage, which steps down the voltage to a level uh, that is usable by the end application. And uh, this also provides some isolation for safety. And this is a typical load in a, in, in a, in a household application. So when we use this type of AC to DC conversion, the input current will look like this here. Uh, you see the, this, uh, the, the graph here, there's the input voltage and then there's the input current here in red. The rectifier only conducts at the peak of the main. So the current is distorted and non-linear. You can clearly see that the current is, is non-linear here. Basically, a PFC circuit for this AC stage, AC to DC stage will try to force the input current uh, to follow the mains voltage. So it is in the same shape and in phase with the AC mains voltage. The goal really for this PFC correction circuit is that it wants, it makes the load looks like a resistor from the point of view of the AC mains. So you may ask, why, why do you really need to do this? Uh, this is largely to comply with some regulatory requirements that are in place to maintain a healthy AC grid. So there are some international standards that stipulate that offline equipment, uh, equipment or uh, or any equipment running from AC mains uh, with the input greater than 75 or 75 watts uh, has power factor power factor correction added. So also, uh, as you can imagine, uh, a load with uh, some very poor power factor correction will draw more load uh, than a load with high power factor correction for the same amount of useful power that is uh, transferred. So this is really not so good from uh, an electrical grid standpoint and you have basically very poor efficiency and a lot of wasted energy. So adding PFC helps to reduce mains pollution and reduces power wastage and uh, basically keeps uh, the currents and voltage waveforms uh, in phase. Just to go into a little bit more detail, uh, there are two more com there are two components to power factor. There is the first is the displacement power factor. Uh, displacement power factor is related to the phase difference between the AC mains current and voltage. Loads that are made up of reactive elements such as inductors and capacitors can result in such a phase displacement between AC current and voltage. Here we can see that the voltage is in black. Uh, the current is in blue uh, and the instantaneous power is in green. For the case where the voltage leads the input current by 45 degrees basically. Because of the phase shift during every AC line cycle, there's a portion of power that is returned to the grid. And basically. On the right here, you can see that the phase difference is now 20 degrees. So you can see the cosine of the angle is higher. So much less power is returned to the grid in every line cycle. So the displacement power factor is defined as the cosine of the phase angle between the voltage and the current. So typically, as you know, the, the cosine of an angle is between typically zero and one. So the range of this value is between zero and one. Ideally, uh, the phase angle is zero, and since the cosine of zero, uh, the cos since the cosine of zero is one, uh, the value of one is ideal in this case for displacement power factor. And distortion power factor is caused by non-linear loads. We talked about non-linear loads earlier. Uh, these are loads which typically distort the shape of the input current. An example of a non-linear load uh, is is a diode bridge rectifier. Uh, as we discussed earlier. The input here is shown in red and the input current, the input voltage is shown in red and the input current is shown in blue here and the output voltage is, is green. You can see that uh, as the conduction only occurs at the peak uh, of the input voltage, uh, you can see that uh, the current waveform is distorted. Uh, this distorted current waveform has high harmonic current, uh, high harmonic content. This uh, current harmonics uh, can cause many issues, such as uh, EMI or electromagnetic inf uh, interference. 
and it could also damage some sensitive electronic equipment and it could uh, basically cause tripping of circuit breakers due to large uh, instantaneous currents. The total harmonic distortion or THD is the key specification uh, that is related to the AC mains current distortion and it is expressed as a percentage and obviously the lower the better. Here on this slide I'm just showing international standards such as this IEC 61000 uh, which basically drive equipment manufacturers to achieve a certain THD performance in their power factor correction circuit. So typically the standard uh, specifies for harmonic input currents up to the 40th harmonic for class A equipment. So again, so the total power factor is a combination of displacement and distortion power factor. So you can see here uh, on this on this first uh, formula here, uh, you have the total power factor. And, and really uh, the total harmonic distortion is the other item that we talked about. We want the total power factor to be as high as possible and uh, the total harmonic distortion to be as low as possible. These specs are typically measured with a power meter uh, and some scopes also provide the capability to measure these. So essentially the goal of PS PFC here, so to summarize what I just talked about, you really want to reduce unwanted harmonics by shaping the input current to follow the input voltage so that the AC mains see just a resistive load. Now I'll briefly introduce some PFC topologies. This is the most common and standard boost PFC stage. It consists of basically uh, a diode bridge rectifier and followed by a boost stage. And now there is also an output filter uh, the boost stage controls the input current to follow the input input voltage and it also regulates the DC output voltage to roughly about 400 volts. The standard practice here would be to control the boost stage with a PFC ASIC controller. A PFC stage will have a certain efficiency and some power will be lost as energy passes from the input to output. In a bridgeless design that is shown here, this bridgeless design removes the bridge rectifier diodes from the conduction path. And as a result, this can improve efficiency by a couple of percentage at certain operating points. There are ASICs available for this topology also, but sometimes digital controllers are used as switching and controls are more complicated than standard boost PMC. Finally, we show the bridgeless totem pole PFC. As you can see, this topology contains no diodes, uh, just two half bridges and can achieve the highest efficiency of close to 98 to 99%. It is typically used only at uh, very high power levels. And there are two half bridges here. Uh, one, the, the one on the left, uh, will switch at uh, converter switching frequency in the range of tens of kilohertz. And the other, will switch at the AC mains frequency, so roughly about 50 hertz in Europe. If standard MOSFETs are used on the high frequency switching leg, you don't get maximum efficiency because of issues due to things like losses and reverse recovery and uh, the body diodes of a silicon MOSFET. So to make this work efficiently, we typically use wide band gap transistors such as silicon carbide or gallium, gallium nitride on the high frequency leg. Also, since the switching and control schemes for this topology is very complex, digital controllers like the DSP33 series are used. So hopefully I gave a good introduction for you to understand PFC a little bit better, some of the challenges and some of the goals of uh, PFC correction topologies. Now I will introduce the DSP33 totem pole demonstration application platform. In this this picture, the uh, the 
the, the size of the of the uh, evaluation module here is the size of roughly of an A4 page and roughly weighs about four kgs in weight when the heat sink is included. So in this totem pole topology, there are silicon carbide switches. Uh, what we're doing here is we're implementing conduction mode, uh, continuous conduction mode uh, topology for control for this. And uh, so you can, this can be operated in single phase, in three phase, or in, or, or in uh, split phase modes. And typically, the input AC voltage uh, can be operated from between 90 volts to 260 volts. You can operate this in low voltage mode. And the max output voltage can be set to about 900 volts. And the output maximum power for this demonstration application is 11 kilowatts. And the max input current uh, is about 16 amps. And uh, this topology, this PFC topology, the switching frequency is roughly about 100 kilohertz. And in essence uh, this is a development board where you can probe all different major points on the board but it has the performance of uh, a well-designed and tightly laid out reference design so that's the key point here this can be configured as i mentioned in either high input voltage mode or a low voltage mode uh, based on the equipment that you have in your lab uh, and the design is very modular it has plug-in cards which can be used and changed so that you can uh, use the optimum controller or the optimum FETs uh, for your final product. So you can see here on this design, there's a digital power PIM uh, and uh, this digital power PIM uh, can, has the, the DSP33 controller on it. And there are multiple different controllers in different families of the DSP. So you can choose the appropriate DSP family based on the, the memory requirement, whether you need a single or a dual core, uh, <coughs> or based on the number of PWMs, you can choose uh, the right DSP. So that's one of the reasons why we have a little bit of flexibility there. Uh, and then there is an isolated voltage acquisition board, which does a lot of the measurements, uh, and then the, the SIC power cards. So these are the uh, SIC FETs here. There's a little bit of a heat sink there. And again, here you can choose uh, different PIMs that you would like, different uh, different fetch that you would like, and and choose the one that is appropriate for your final product. <coughs> so now, just talking about some of the the target markets for this uh, demonstration application. These uh, work well in applications like energy storage solutions like e-bikes and e-scooters, which are becoming very popular now. And uh, because of the bi-directionality uh, of this reference solution, these can be implemented in uh, applications like uh, hybrid solar inverters and also in EV chargers, uh, which is one of the, the key um, applications for this in, in onboard chargers as well. So to, here is one example for a solar inverter. Uh, so here you have a, a fairly standard block diagram. You have the photovoltaic cells at the top. Then you have a DC to DC with uh, uh, maximum power point tracking. And then there's a DC bus here. There's a DC to DC stage, which powers the battery. And then, <clears throat> and here is where the unit will fit here. So uh, in the unit in orange here, the block in orange, uh, this is really essentially connecting the battery to either the grid uh, or the or the appliances uh, at home. So, so if you're uh, charging the battery from the grid, uh, you can use AC voltage from the from the grid uh, to convert to DC and then charge the battery. Uh, when, uh, or if you want to power the appliances, you can you can use the same unit and con uh, operate it in uh, as a DC to AC inverter uh, and and use the battery voltage to power the appliances. Uh, in 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 the home, so so you can see here how this uh, bidirectional capability of this uh, uh, of this unit, this uh, PFC uh, application, works well in uh, in solar uh, application. And another application is the onboard charger. Uh, so typically, the onboard charger has a PFC stage uh, and a DC to DC stage. So uh, 
this PFC stage works really well in this application uh, because of the totem pole topology, uh, high, high efficiency, as I mentioned, and the bidirectionality capability. So you can uh, essentially use the grid to, uh, to charge the EV. Uh, and also, if you want to uh, send power back to the grid from the EV, that's also possible because of the bidirectionality nature of this uh, totem pole application. So just a little bit more of a, a block diagram of uh, what are some of the key components of this uh, development system. This can be operated in a single or three phase uh, source. So typically in uh, with a single phase, you can uh, you can get up to about three and a half kilowatts of power. And if you want to operate this at 11 kilowatts, uh, uh, typically uh, the three phases are required. So we have uh, the DSPIC33 uh, digital power PIM and uh, the new uh, FET PIMs for the silicon carbide MOSFETs as I briefly mentioned about. So this development board is available for evaluation and this can be configured for low voltage or nominal voltage operation. So that's the key. So if you're doing it at the, on, on your benchtop on your lab, you can operate this in low voltage operation and, uh, and have the voltages in a much more uh, safe uh, environment. So really the key value proposition of this uh, demonstration application uh, and uh, uh, for, for applications uh, like solar and also more specifically for uh, EV applications is to really quickly generate code and, uh, and uh, release product to market. So time to market is critical in many cases and the modular uh, format of this reference design in terms of the hardware and software can, can enable a quick product release to, uh, to market. And the software algorithms are in a very structured frame, framework and can support different operating modes. Like for example, I talked about the PFC and the inverter stage. Uh, you can uh, fairly easily configure the design and convert it from one module from um, one format to another for, for like a PFC or an inverter stage. And it talked about the high modularity and then the DSP controller. Uh, so a dual core is used in this uh, application. Uh, essentially, this dual core helps to isolate some of the core functionality say for example the pfc uh, can be isolated on one of the cores and a lot of the high house quick housekeeping functionalities uh, uh, such as the communication to the rest of the system and all of that can be uh, uh, ex executed on uh, on a different core okay so from a resources standpoint what is available uh, so uh, you can reach out to your microchip or worth representative to request uh, an evaluation module uh, a demand, uh, some design files and and also uh, a live demonstration if you would like so we have uh, uh, we will we will of course provide you with all details about things like the design files uh, hardware design and also we will uh, assist you with uh, any firmware uh, algorithms that uh, you would like to create of your own as well, based on some building bo blocks that we already provide. So in addition to just the hardware, there is a bit of a tool chain as well that uh, comes with the microchip solution. Uh, for the hardware, of course, we will provide uh, the complete Altium PCB design files. Um, and then uh, of course, uh, we will have uh, the MP Lab source code project uh, that that will that will be available with this, and then uh, we have some uh, Mindy models uh, for uh, application level simulation models uh, that can be provided with the design as well. Obviously, <coughs> we will um, provide you some test data and some hardware and firmware support to really help you accelerate your product development. And we have uh, uh, a development board configurator. Uh, this is part of uh, our MP LabX project and can really help you with uh, some of the configuration and, and programming of, uh, of the key parameters uh, of this uh, demonstration application. And, and for connection to the PC, uh, we have the Peak Can dongle, and this really enables the connection of uh, the demonstrator to um, 
a visualizer GUI which runs on, uh, uh, on the PC. And so this PowerBoard visualizer G, uh, GUI can be used to set uh, different voltage references and uh, you can uh, configure this in, in different operating modes and you also get um, a lot of different uh, parameters that can be read from the board, from different parts of the board to, to verify how things are working and uh, implemented. So that, in a sense, is uh, our, uh, a, a high-level introduction to uh, the totem pole demonstration application. Uh, and uh, in partnership with Worth, we can make this available uh, for you uh, very shortly. And with that, I will transfer it to, um, to Worth. So you can find a lot of collateral available uh, for this design. So there's a landing page on microchip. Uh, we can provide you firmware for the for this uh, for the totem pole PFC. It's already available, uh, and for the and uh, for the power control and also firmware for the voltage uh, voltage acquisition board is also available uh, on on discover.microchip.com at these links. Okay, perfect. Yeah, um, back to it. Um... As I said, I'm working in virtual electronic as a product definition engineer, and I'm uh, today going to talk about um, the products being used in the totem pole PFC design from Birdside. So that's the agenda for today. Um, we are going to talk with uh, about the push-pull transformer um, as new parts and their characteristics and their application in the microchip design. Um, also, we are going to talk about one of the most important parts uh, from the passive side, which is a, a PFC choke and also our um, custom capabilities and the new um, standard uh, flat wire chokes. And um, we will go briefly through the advantages of using flat wire um, for, for the design of the PFC choke. And also, I'm going to introduce the a new a DC link uh, capacitors um, that we have recently and going through some characteristics, showing um, some additional resources. And last but not least, um, I'm going to show all the standard products that we can offer for uh, such a design and for your own design. So let's jump to the push-pull transformers or the VEPPTI. Um, as um, you can see, the push-pull transformers are ACQ200 qualified and we have 19 um, catalog standard parts. That means there is no minimum order quantity for these parts. Um, what um, one of the most uh, advantages of these uh, push-pull transformers that um, they can reach a volt second product up to 41 my, uh, volt microseconds uh, with a switching frequency up to 620 kilohertz. These transformers are SMD transformers, comes in small size and low profile with a, a long or a high operating temperature range uh, ranging from minus 40 to 125 degrees. Um, typical applications for uh, the push-pull transformers is uh, isolated interfaces as CAN interface, SPI, I, uh, I2C, low power LAN or RS interface can also be used for um, gate driver power supplies, AC motor drives, or polyphase energy meters. So getting back to the block diagram of the PFC totem pole choke, we can see where the push-pull transformers have been used. Um, so we have here um, our push-pull transformer for the CAN interface. Also, uh, we have a custom push-pull transformer being used for the SIC um, gate drivers. Um, tailored for, for especially for this design. Um, and jumping next to the next important part, which is a PFC choke. Um, for this design, we have a lot of uh, versions for the PFC chokes. Um, I think on VJ's um, presentation, you have seen uh, different uh, chokes. Um, and also we have um, the custom uh, PFC chocks that we created for, for the design. In this case is uh, custom PP, MPP core PFC chocks, which is um, a molypermaloy powder consistent of molybdenum, nickel, and ferrite. Uh, what are the advantages of this MPP core? 
it has the lowest core losses um, among um, the, the powder material, all the powder materials, and um, has also very good or the best temperature stability, which is under 1%, which makes these cores very useful when um, used with, with uh, higher DC bias. The maximum saturation current of these cores is uh, 8,000 Gauss or 0.8 Tesla. But of course, uh, when we talk about uh, very good cores, good quality cores, it comes always with a high cost. As you can see here, the chokes are right after the EMI filter, and as VJ has already uh, mentioned, uh, if you're using a single phase or a three phase course, so you will need the three of them, and um, they are placed here directly um, after the EMI filter. So the another standard family that we have is uh, flat wire cores. These uh, or PFC chokes, sorry. These uh, have cores with high flux cores or sand dust cores. Um, the high flux cores is a mixture between nickel and ferrite, and the sand dust is aluminum, silicon, and ferrite mixture. Uh, we have 17 standard products uh, for the flat wire PFC chokes. That means, again, uh, no minimum order quantity. And we have inductance values uh, starting from 118 microhenry up to 720 microhenry with a voltage up to one kilovolt DC. It also comes with a very high saturation current thanks to the flat wire up to 105 amps uh, with a temperature range from minus 40 to 155. Um, the core sizes varies from 53 millimeters to 99 millimeters of diameter with a maximum height of 62 millimeter. Also these PFC uh, flat wire chokes are ACQ200 qualified um, so they can also be used in um, e-mobility applications. Um, here is, um, we can see that the flat wire windings come with some advantages, which I will go through also um, a bit later. Uh, we can see that they have a very low interwinding capacitance. They minimize the skin effect and proximity effect, a lower DC resistance, and they are mechanically stable. As I said, the typical applications, um, EV chargers, solar inverters, industrial or medical AC-DC converters, and telecom PSU. Here we can see the uh, standard parts uh, with the size, rated current, and saturation current for each of them. And we can see here that uh, we have done some measurements without airflow and with airflow, and we can see, of course, that there is improvement of the rate of current with uh, using the airflow. What we can also see here that for the same inductance value, let's take this part as an example, uh, um, and, and this one, as you can see, the saturation current is 23 amps, and for this one is a 9.5 amp. That uh, is because that we are using different core materials and that's why the saturation current is changing for the same inductance value. The size of these parts um, is relatively smaller um, compared to competition parts. Um, and um, as I said, there is no minimum order quantity for these parts, so it makes them very needed uh, for new designs. Yeah, um, we have said that these, these PFC chokes are flat wire chokes, so why are we using flat wire? Um, as I briefly mentioned that um, there is a skin effect. Um, so mainly the skin effect is induced inside the, the wire by itself through these eddy currents, which um, cancel the current flow in the center and with increasing the frequency, the current flow tends to be only on the outer diameter of uh, of the copper wire or the wire used. Um, and this problem increased with increasing the frequency, so um, we are not using the whole area of the, of the wire and um, it causes a lot of um, AC resistance and higher losses. The skin depths can be measured uh, where the density um, reaches 37% of the value at the surface. So um, that's one problem that comes with um, normal 
wire being used. That's why flat wire is uh, has an advantage in this case. Another effect that comes as well um, is a proximity effect, as we can see the adjacent um, wires when in the winding around the core, they also induce currents um, towards each other. So if the the current flowing in the wires in the same direction, it acts like as a magnet. So the, the current will flow on the outer uh, parts of, of the wires or if it's uh, flowing in the opposite direction, so it will attract the current to be flowing in the inner sides of, um, of the wires. With um, the flat wire, we don't have this problem and we also we can uh, decrease the AC resistance uh, happening um, because of the proximity effect. The proximity effect also increases with increasing um, the frequency. So we, when we are, whenever we are talking about wide band gap material, um, we also uh, talk about higher frequencies, and um, that's what makes the flat wire trucks best fit for uh, wide gap band gap materials. Um, here is a small experiment um, by taking two um, cores of the same size. One is with flat wire, and one with uh, with a normal wire being used. And as we can see that um, the inductance value is almost uh, the same for for the both uh, parts. However, we can see a slight change in the DCR, which is um, 0.6 milliohm. We will see what uh, difference could it make. And um, there is a huge improvement in the interwinding capacitance um, compared compared from the flat wire chokes to um, the round wire ones, uh, which is already an advantage. And uh, we can see also the slight increase in the rate of current for the flat wire chokes. Talking about the capacitance as well, for the round wire uh, PFC chokes, uh, we can see that the capacitance is not uh, only series capacitance, but also um, um, parallel capacitance. So we have the capacitance between the the wires, um, adjacent wires and wires um, over each other. Um, while in the flat wire chokes, as we have only um, the, the, the series parasitic capacitance, so we have a huge improvement and that's why we have seen the improvement in the interwinding capacitance that it's very low with the flat wire ones. So um, as we said, we have already seen the 0.6 milliohm difference in the DC resistance. And um, at 15 amp, we can see a difference of 14.3 degrees um, um, for, for the temperature. So um, for higher currents, we can also expect that the temperature uh, difference will be higher. Um, that's because um, the flat wire trucks have better heat dissipation capabilities compared to the round wire ones. So wrapping it up, um, the conclusion, um, we can see it here in the real equivalent circuit of the inductor. As we have the inductive region uh, or the capacitive, the inductive region, capacitive region and resonant region, starting with the capacitive region, um, since we have a less interwinding capacitance, so we can use these um, chokes for higher frequency. For um, the DC resistance part, since we have a lower DCR, um, we have lower losses. And um, since we are reducing the skin effect and the proximity effect, uh, we are reducing the AC losses. Uh, Last but not least, the flat wire uh, has higher mechanical stability than the um, round wire being used. Going to the next product uh, family that uh, we have recently announced is the DC link film caps or the MKP uh, KP film capacitors. We have 24 standard parts Again, no minimum order quantity with capacitance value from one microfarad to 75 microfarad um, with a voltage up to 1.2 kilovolt DC. Um, it comes in different packaging with uh, different pitch distances, 
starting from 27.5 millimeter up to 52.5 millimeter. Um, MKP is uh, yeah, polypropylene metallized film, so we have the metallization as electrodes and uh, a propylene film as um, the dielectric. Um, so it makes it uh, very useful when it when, um, comes to high ripple current and also these DC uh, link caps um, comes with the self-healing properties um, that also extends their um, load life and uh, storage life. Just a small comparison between the new DC link, uh, DC link caps and the aluminum electrolytic capacitors. Um, so as we said, the rated voltage goes up to 1.2 um, kilovolt. So it makes it perfect for um, SIG modules, as an example. And while the aluminum electrolytic caps, they go up to 600 volts. So serious connection um, is needed in this case. The DC uh, link caps, they come with a very low ESR. Um, so they make them um, cap their capabilities for higher mass current better and um, the ripple current can could be several amps per microfarad while the aluminum electrolytic capacitors they have a relatively higher ESR um, depending on the part it ranges from 1 milliampere per pro microfarad till 20 milliampere pro microfarad however the aluminum electrolytic capacitors they have they have high capacitance value uh, is a microfarad pro millimeter uh, power three. The DC link capacitors, they have low capacitance, they may um, also cause high voltage ripple. And uh, for the aluminum electrolytic capacitors, yeah, the large bulk capacitance uh, for low voltage ripple, as we said that um, they have higher capacitances. But yeah, the two more advantages of the DC link capacitors is that in these capacitors, as we have seen, there is no liquid being used inside in contrary to the aluminum electrolytic ones. So it makes it um, better for long storage and load life. And since it have also a self healing property, so um, it makes more robust and uh, reliable in many applications. In our simulation tool, Red Expert, you can find also uh, more details about these um, DC um, link caps, um, some diagrams, and um, also you can choose your right part, not only for the caps, but for all our products, electronic products or um, standard products, um, whether you can choose by product or you can also use our different design tools for choosing the right product for your application. There are also some more information about the DC link caps. We have some uh, webinars that have been already uh, done. You can find it on YouTube. There are also some applica application notes and we have an extra webinar on 11th of July. Yeah, getting to the last uh, point. Yeah, what we can offer for uh, for such a design um, so we are starting from the magnetics uh, with the EMI suppression uh, products as ferrite beads, um, using power inductors, whether shielded, unshielded inductors, uh, combo chokes, the push-pull transformer, gate drive transformer, and um, more um, inductors. And a lot of families for the capacitors, whether the ceramic capacitors, film capacitors, um, EMI suppression capacitors, um, aluminum electrolytic capacitors, and also some LEDs and electromechanical component as the pin headers, uh, terminal blocks, subconnectors, these subconnectors, um, um, the, the, the voltage, um, yeah, sorry, um, the, these, uh, the, the resistance um, changing voltage the mechanical switches, 
spacers with um, extra thread or without so that we have um, a whole portfolio that is covering um, such design and we can support you gladly with your designs and um, as I said for most of our products we don't have um, many minimum order uh, quantity so feel free to contact your um, um, sales um, guy from Word and um, or also get in contact with uh, microchip and um, you can get all the parts from from both of us. We invite you to join us at Worth Electronic Online and view our vast array of electronic and electromechanical components. While you're there, you can also download the microchip DSPIC33CH demo board reference design and browse Worth Electronics surface mount common mode line filters and TVS diode used in the design. You can also test drive the online tool Red Expert completely free of charge. Using this tool, you can download data sheets, make comparisons, and easily order free samples directly from the website. To view the materials discussed today and replay the video, check out our YouTube page. You're listening to Worth Electronics What's Up Radio Podcast, where each week we are seeing what's up in the world of electronics and PCB design. We'll be checking in with leading industry experts and our very own Worth Electronic technical specialists who are going to shine a light on interesting topics, such as energy harvesting, wireless power transfer, EMI issues, and so much more. Tune in to get technical design tips and applications during your commute, at your desk, or wherever you might be with Worth Electronics What's Up Podcast. Podcast.